Well, hopefully everyone will be joining in with us here as we um, finally have a little shift in our schedule that's lined up for Terry and I to sit down and spend about a half an hour talking about some key issues for the work of an evangelist. Um, today, when we uh, walk through our outline, we're going to be trying to uh, get a little bit better. I don't know, maybe reoccurring themes of preaching and working uh, in an evangelistic teaching capacity. And that's what we do when we encounter passages that are maybe individually on our end, a little outside of our reach. Maybe with the person we're talking about, there's some difficulties there. And so we're going to try to break those down, at least using the models that Terry and I use to approach solid answers to sometimes challenging questions. Um, Terry, how are you doing? Uh, it's been a busy morning, but I'm doing well. Yeah. Well, let's get right at it. Good to see that you're here. Got the, the busyness kind of died down for a second. Uh, so for our outline concept of what we're doing, we've got three areas we'll look at. We're going to start right at the top uh, and kind of break down some of the most common Bible difficulties that are presented. Uh, it's very common, at least in my experience, when someone talks about a conflict in the text, um, maybe they don't think that the Bible is in harmony with itself, a uh, very issue, uh, sometimes even on the application side, is a misunderstanding of the covenantial nature of God's interaction with man, that God has covenants with smaller subsets of all humanity that might be specific to them. Generally, we talk about things like the Old Covenant, New Covenant, or Old Testament, New Testament. And I would say, uh, since all statistics are made up on the go, uh, more than 50%, less than 70% uh, of the conflict type questions, the difficulty type questions, kind of fill that basket where someone is asking a question about something in the Old Testament, about its interaction with something in the New Testament. Terry, is that about the same for you? Yeah, it seems to be so. Um... I think uh, a lot of times, a lot of those contradictions have uh, covenant issues related to them. And uh, especially, I think that's the case of uh, maybe what I would say non-believers or the unchurched who ask these kind of questions, um, that they have those kind of uh, covenant issues that play in there and, and that plays a major part. Right. And, um, you know, there'll be things as simple as, well, I read in the scriptures that um, you can't do this thing, whether the thing is mix crops in the field, whether the thing is put wine into old wine skins, whether the thing is um, dress a certain way, use certain fabrics, uh, and they'll say, look, there you go. I have now shown you and illustrated to you how silly the Bible is. Um, that's generally the, the, the source uh, motivation, it seems, for a lot of those questions. Now, I diffuse it in a pretty simple way. The first thing I ask them to do is to open up their Bible and show me the passage they're talking about. Um, I want to read it with them in their text. Now, generally, that forces the person to either pull out a little piece of paper they printed off the internet and look for it, which is totally cool. Like, I, I want them to do that partly because I want to make a point. Um, but secondly, um, I think it's really important to be genuine about it and approach the question in an authentic, open way and say, okay, let's look at it together. And so wherever the question is coming from, we look at the first passage they're talking about, and then we begin to do what Jesus did a lot, and that's ask questions. What do you genuinely see in this text that's called, causing this question to come up? You know, what, what's going on? Because I'll turn in, I'll turn that attack, if you will, on the integrity of the Bible into an actual Bible study, uh, if they'll let me. Um, that's trying to diffuse the the pressure on it. The same area is a general misunderstanding of what the intent of the old law was. Um, Israel's interaction with the covenant is, is something that I think for a lot of unbelievers, a lot of folks who are believers generally in God, but not Bible familiar, uh, is a bit of a giant mystery. We're like, 
oh yeah, they had a covenant. Uh, and then, then it stops exactly at that point. Um, and so conflict comes up when there's a contrast between the spiritual side of the Old Testament and the social, social political side of the Old Testament covenant relationship where um, there, there's equal expectations of do things a certain way at a certain time because God said so, but they may not necessarily interact in the same way for the Israelite. Um, and I really try to bring that focus in there. Uh, and so that requires a little longer process to get to the same outcome, which is this is actually what God was asking. It wasn't some arbitrary set of random rules and here it is, only do it this way. It met itself in the bigger picture of God's teaching and plan in this way. Um, Terry, uh, in, in connection with that, um, and we're going to probably talk a little bit about this too, sometimes the issues are um, a little bit more complex. And I think we can set aside covenant issues really quickly. And if folks, by the way, if you've got a question about a passage in the course of this conversation, type it out there. We'll, we'll do our best to dissect it like we would anything else. And so for those who are watching and maybe they've got a question, uh, drop it that way. But some of the issues come up with a little bit more complexity. Uh, and dealing with difficult Bible passages um, sometimes require us to first say the answer, I don't know, and then dig in a little deeper and go, all right, let's begin to break this down. Is this maybe an issue of translation? Uh, and for me, translation is going to start to fall in into this basket. Um, the text in its original context, Hebrew, uh, Greek, etc., has then moved into English. Has my poor understanding of either of those two subjects made it difficult for me to understand what God was getting at? Um, and the, the great example of that is idioms. And I'll talk about that in a second. But Terry, uh, for you, uh, what are some of your experiences or insight when, you're, when you've exhausted covenant issues of conflict and you've moved into these areas that are a little more complex? Like, what are some of the things that you've seen in that basket of next level challenges that would be helpful for all of us? Let me first say this. I think one of the challenges to this, and I'm going to try to say this as nice as I can, is that you mentioned this earlier somewhat, is that most people who bring these kind of um, challenges to you are looking to disprove something. And, and they're somewhat, they bring their own worldview and potentially their own bias into that conversation, which, which makes that a difficult conversation to have to begin with. Um, so many times for me, it's not just translations, but I don't know if you've seen this, but a lot of times they just ignore the context that is involved in the passage. Um, and especially if they're not what you would call a uh, honest Bible student who's, who's, if they're looking for a reason to disprove Scripture, um, it's very common in some of these discussions to lift something from its context and and lift it even from the cultural context, maybe not even the written context. And as a as a problem there, what happens is um, they're creating a conflict that doesn't even exist to begin with. Um, and so sometimes what you have to do is you have to make sure that you try to show in the best way possible how the context answers their question. And how two different contexts could have two different completely sets of instructions um, given in those in those cases, um, and and that to me that seems to be one of the greater areas that's not even um, and sometimes the translation will help with that, but 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 a lot of times it's just ignoring the passage in its in its original in, intent to begin with. Right, and I think a great illustration of that is uh, um, word mechanics, uh, language mechanics. Um, there's a section of literature in the Bible that is deeply literal. That is, portions of the text are exactly as rendered someone did something at a certain place in a certain way. But as you move beyond the literal, you're going to be encountering symbolism. You're going to be encountering um, metaphors. Uh, details that are all kind of 
a little bit more, and I use this, painting the tapestry rather than supporting the easel upon which the, the tapestry sits. And language does that a lot. And, and uh, the concept of a, an idiom is really, really kind of the easiest way to describe that. If I were to say to somebody, hey man, you're after that like a tick on a coon dog. Um, you know, uh, that's a, a layered idiom that's Southern in context and everyone would go like, I know exactly what you're getting at. Um, it's literal. But the idiom means a little bit more than just the literal phrase of the small insect doing its best to survive on the flesh of the coon dog. So that, that, that kind of shift, if you will, in understanding takes place a lot in the Bible um, from the Old Testament, even back in the literal, deeply historical, like um, Exodus uh, and the framing of the conflicts between God uh, and the gods of Egypt, a lot of that um, wordplay is built on the deeper appreciation of Egyptian history and uh, their religious practices. Now, we don't see that in the layers of the text because the text comes off as a history when it's actually a history that's also kind of a deeply painted portrait of redemption. Um, so context drives that. You can ask the question, okay, if it's literal, got it. But is there something in the text that suggests to me that they've shifted from the literal to the figurative, to a figurative form of conversation? And even within that, there are some branches that help us with, co with context. Is it past, present, or future in the prophetic sense? Is they taking a portion of the past we can only really pursue from the sense of the mind's eye where the prophets speak in relation to their presence of God, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and even some of the words that come in there are, are that way. Um, there's also some difficulties that will come into place um, simply because the factors involved are challenging. Uh, they challenge us from a number of layers. Uh, it might be challenging because, um, and if, we can use this interplay. One of the apostles can write about another apostle and say his writings are hard to understand. That means some of that stuff is hard. Uh, now the challenge might be coming from our ignorance. Like I don't know enough of the historical events they're referencing, or I don't know enough about whom God is, or it might be hard because our own spirituality hasn't developed enough. We're still thinking carnally. We're still babes in Christ and to really appreciate it, we need to mature some. They just make it hard, um, you know, and there's sections of the middle portions of Romans that you could certainly put into that category. But I even include some of Peter's writings. The text of Revelation um, has some edges to it, although as a side shout out to Revelation, if you want to understand Revelation better, understand the prophets better. Um, you know, that's really how you uh, translate Revelation into conversational speech. Um, so on those edges, you get those conflicts of, I don't understand, but I said, I don't know what to do with it. Um, yeah. and they're generally more manageable when, when you can kind of break it down and say, that's a metaphor. Okay. And it's this kind of metaphor, um, et cetera. Um, one of the things that I think is important to catch up to, and I hinted at this already, simply speaking, and Jesus tells this do too. Some of the things that God asks his people to do are hard. They're hard to receive. Um, I made mention of this elsewhere. I guess this was probably almost 20 years ago. I was sitting in a Bible study uh, on the West Coast, up in the Northeast, Northwest that is, uh, and they were studying through the end of Nehemiah, and the section turned to um, the expectation to separate from their wives. Uh, and they were doing that in the text. It was recording that. And so I shot my hand up uh, because if it's a Bible class and there's a difficult thing going on, I want to kind of consider it in different ways. And I sat there in that class for the final 20 minutes with my hand up, waiting to be called on. And the teacher of the class put his head down and never acknowledged my existence. It got so obvious the people around me who had saw my arm up were like, He's not answering, he's not asking his question. Like, why, what's going on? They're so confused. 
um, it has nothing to do with what I wanted to ask, but I think sometimes we get nervous about a hard saying that we won't even engage it because we're today might have to do the same thing or just even interacting with the awfulness of a home being broken up and how that would all play out on a personal level of there could be children, there could be relationships, love, affection, feeling, compassion, all that's being broken up because it's hard to receive. Um, and I think that probably also harkens back to the reasons why people bring these lists up from time to time. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's interesting is you talked about how there's hard things for us. I think one of the things to understand is there may be some things we can't understand. I think that plays a role in these contradiction difficulties is, is um, there is this fundamental thought in our process that we have the ability to understand all things, and uh, that may not necessarily be true. And I think that I, I use that in regards to not just ourselves, but also to approach the people who are bringing up these passages sometimes uh, with that kind of a, an understanding. I mean, I had um, we were teaching evidences one time, and a guy came up and talked to me. And it was this wasn't about a passage, but it's the same kind of thing, where you know he he didn't want to talk about the things we were talking about evidences. He wanted to talk about um, things like string theory and and other explanations of the universe. Uh, and of course, I, I looked at it and said, I'm, I'm not familiar with those things. But outside of that, you know, some of that stuff is just so somewhat theoretical and even new theory uh, that it's very difficult. And sometimes we just need to back away and go, yeah, and especially if things are non-biblical, that's easy. Well, what about the scriptures? I mean, sometimes there are things that somebody asks me, well, how do you believe that's true? And I just got to believe by faith that's true. Um when there's no apparent contradiction. Um, and I think that's an important part of this conversation to have, you know, um, it's like you talked about these difficult things, there's difficult passages, there's passages I understand better today than I did 20 years ago. Uh, and there's passages I will understand in better 20 years from now than I do today. And they probably in that understanding look a lot less difficult and look like they're a lot less in conflict than they used to in that sense as well. So um, I just think to, to kind of caution us as we approach, sometimes to, to have that humility to understand, I may not be able to explain this fully because it is so difficult and so hard. Um, and I think we generally have a hard time acknowledging that. And I think especially the people who bring up passages, one of the problems is they have a hard time acknowledging that there's something they can't understand in that sense or may have difficulty to understand uh, in those senses. You know, string, theory is, uh, string theory is fascinating, uh, but certainly is not going to answer the questions that come up. You know, and here's an illustration of the process Terry just hinted at. Uh, as a new believer, when you encounter a section like Numbers 21 uh, or any of the times where to bring judgment to a nation, including the women and the children, we immediately um, uh, take that group and we turn them all into innocents. We tell all of them, adults, choose, and we say, these innocent people were just slaughtered by the Israelites. As a new believer, that was really hard to grapple with, in part because I hadn't paid attention to the details of the spirituality of those nations, and basically the lack of it, uh, that Israel was serving as a, as a judge for God, and that judgment meant that there was a consequence, and the consequence was brought out by people who had to do an awful task. And that's really hard to accept on the first reading. Second reading, third reading, fourth reading, fifth reading, I didn't see it. Five, six years down the road, hit me like a ton of bricks. Uh, and even today, it's still hard to process, but there's a little bit more the additional perspectives yeah absolutely you could add other things that um the the one of the ones i always had difficulty with was in ezra um where you know it's not the elimination of a whole race but it is the putting off of all these wives and their children uh and that seems to be in such conflict with god's laws about marriage and um and initially, you look at that at the destruction of all those homes, and 
uh, for me, that initially was a struggle. And then you later understand there was a reason for that. And those two examples are tied together in their reasoning, uh, the influence they had on God's people. Um, but somebody who doesn't want to see that will bring that as an apparent conflict or, hey, look, God did this uh, or God did that. And um, and so it, that's a difficult thing to explain um, and to show. And then it's difficult to explain because once you're done explaining in those two cases, especially, then once you explain the conflict and that it's not a conflict, then you've got to go back and that ultimately is what we started off to back to the covenants and then, then the understanding that follows from that and how those things are, are different today. Um, so it's interesting in that sense how uh, you, you almost have to, a lot of times we're talking about multiple layers in these answers and not just one. Right. Here's another edge to, uh, you know, even in the time of Christ, when he was dealing with, and we'll use marriage again just one last time, um, some of the Pharisees, some of the Sadducees, some of the believers of that first century who were listening to Jesus turned off the radio, in essence, when he began to talk about the accountability of a marriage relationship. That, hey, look, there are only a limited number of really justifiable answers to the breaking of a marriage. And here's the great parallel. Israel was one where God constantly set a standard of, I'll bring you back. I'll bring you back. Even after what would have been the legitimate reason for breaking the marriage, he still brings them back. Uh, it, it's not a real surprise that in the New Testament, when Jesus goes back to the beginning, his standard kind of matches God, which is you stay. You stay and you work it out. Um, you know, there, there seems to be some nice um, thematic consistency there. I'm going to include two more things. I don't know how deep Terry wants to join me in this dive. Um, but uh, some of the conflicts that are textual in nature, and I'm talking about number agreement, I'm talking about location, situation agreement, um, that becomes a lot more challenging. But let me offer some suggestions to folks that work for me. One of the first things that I do when I see an apparent number conflict, that is, let's say you got X number of hundred thousands here, X number of hundred thousands there. The first thing that I do is I say, is there a an understanding that I've got that's influencing this? Have I arrived at a conclusion about what God is doing that made these two things equivalent that aren't equivalent? Are they actually talking about the same thing? Um, that helps sort that out. Uh, a second thing that I'll do is I'll ask a manuscript question. Um, and that is looking at the batch of manuscripts that we translate into the New Testament and the Old Testament. Is there, are we working for something uh, where, where there's only a few little fragments of the manuscript available? Uh, and if that's the case, um, then I'll be a whole lot more cautious in my approach to what's next. What does that mean for it? Um, uh, does the Septuagint reframe some of these things? I think that's probably if it's in the scriptures that the apostles and Jesus used in the first century. It's a nice consistent text that hasn't changed much. Um, I'll maybe even add uh, extra information that's kind of equivalent to that from other textual pools. Um, they kind of reframe it and say, okay, is there more to this than just the math? Um, because there are some challenging sections in the text, and you're going to have to answer them in some way or another at some point. And you can't just push them off to the table. Um, and so that's like the beginning of the process for me, is I start doing more research. Uh, once you get to those very limited, very small edge issues in some ways, I start breaking it down in that process. And then I'll probably even go one more step and begin to ask the question, um, how does this influence theology that I hold to, uh, my understanding of whom God is and his teaching, how does this influence his expectations for me? And, and, and zero influence on these number word agreements. Uh, and in the end, I'll have to really say, I'll have to wait. I'll wait for more information. Uh, maybe the information comes from God at the end of my days. Maybe it comes from 
um, a, an equivalent Dead Sea Scroll event in my lifetime. Um, Terry, do you want to jump in on uh, on that little edge? That wasn't part of our pre-conversation, if you will, but. Well, I'll say that any of those things that, are, like you said, are on the very fringe of this discussion and are very rare, uh, they have zero bearing on what the scriptures say to me about salvation and about morality. Um, I, I don't want to say they're inconsequential, but they're pretty close. Um, and uh, sometimes they make for an interesting discussion, uh, but I don't know that they should bear that much weight uh, in the scheme of how we approach the Bible. Um, now, it's important in those cases, like when you see a number difference in those things, you need to look into that because somebody may bring that up that does not have the purest of intentions, obviously. And um, and in that case, that's important. Um, you know, another one of those that, that you'll see differences if you really want to dive into not just numbers, but also um, genealogies. And uh, that's a section of scripture that we largely leave just untouched. And yet there are some differences there. Now, if you dive into that, you can see some reasoning behind that um, and understand that. Um, but that takes a little bit more. And again, it's not, it doesn't have a, a huge consequence on uh, our faith in that sense. Um, so, you know, those, those things on the fringe are interesting. I think they're interesting for, uh, I don't enjoy them as much as you and salt would, but uh <laughs> They're interesting discussion in those senses, uh, but the the overall thing to keep in mind is um, that they aren't they aren't weighty matters. I think I think some people turn them into weighty matters, but they're not weighty yeah. matters of scripture. Well, from an evidentiary standpoint, they're important that you need to be prepared for the question answering that could come, but you're not going to devote the bulk of your teaching time to them. Um, you know. One of the things I want to include is uh, an approach to dealing with this. Um, you kind of have a couple different models available to you. You can act like there are no challenging sections of the scripture. You can pretend that there's no difficulties, and then eventually you're going to trip and fall flat on your face, uh, textually or personally. Uh, you could be terrified all the time and try to avoid them like the plague and play the, uh, the floor is lava game with these issues. Uh, eventually you'll get burned the other way because eventually you'll have to step somewhere. Uh, my approach generally has been to evaluate um, the occurrence, like how often is this issue going to come up? And if I feel like it's an issue that and I'll teach it openly and publicly and present the best evidence that I have to deal with it, and that's the goal, is to give the best evidence. Uh, anything else after that, uh, even my individual suppositions that might not necessarily be grounded in the text says, is a little less of value to me. And I'll probably uh, shuffle that to the back burner and maybe answer it as a question in a class or something, but it's not gonna be a number one item on the outline, if you will. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll, use a, I'll use a rather fringe example of this kind of thing that happened recently. Um, and, and that has to do with uh, somebody talked to me about the way a teacher handled a certain word that in one case um, seemed to say this was included in that word. In another case, it wasn't. I'm not going to get into the details in case anybody's listening. But uh, the response to the question was, well, that's just not what it means and moved on. And that was a completely unsatisfying explanation for that person, uh, as you can imagine, where it would have been much more gratifying for them and satisfying if they had said, hey, look, here's some reasonable explanations of how this occurred. Um, you know, and I know there's a possible conflict of some kind, like you, I'm going to be prepared and I'm probably going to bring that up uh, if it's a pretty common one. And I'm going to, I'm going to say, Hey, here's a common conflict in this passage. Now that's not in a sermon that's in a Bible class, but that's a common conflict here. And, and just so you understand, here's an explanation as to how that would occur in this way. Um, and I won't say that this is the exact reason usually. I'll just simply say, here's, here's a real logical explanation of how this happened. That may include some of the things we talked about, language. It may include manuscript evidence. may include a lot of things along the way. But I've always found it to be better to introduce that and somewhat be honest and open and transparent about that 
rather than try to hide from that altogether and pretend like it's not there uh, or to pretend like you have some definitive made up answer without any reasonable justification. Uh, Both of those are really bad plans for how to handle that situation. Right. And let me add two more tidbits. Um, You don't have to be an expert on all of these things. Um, What you have to be from a teacher, preacher, educator standpoint is willing to do two things. One, say, I don't know. And two, do some research. Um, Good research will take your I don't know to here are some quality answers. Um, Sourcing out those quality answers can be challenging. It takes time. It takes effort. Um, You're going to spend some time at the library, all that stuff. But on a practical level, um, those are the things that happen, um, you know, where you go and you learn and you come back and now you have a slightly higher level of expertise in dealing with this particular uncommon Bible issue. you know, it's interesting, just like uh, Beetlejuice, you said salts, and salt shows up on the feed. I think we better be careful. Um, I don't know how that uh, particularly worked out. I probably sm- smelled out the conversation. I'll say this. You know, you said going to the library. I just thought that's what Wikipedia was for these days. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, burn that down. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Wikipedia should be burnt to the ground unless it's talking about pop culture. Um, yeah. So if you have a biblical conflict, just go to Wikipedia. It will give you all the right answers. That's heavy sarcasm, by the way. Uh, But, uh, yeah, sometimes it takes a lot of effort and energy to be able to find some of these answers. And sometimes there may not be great answers. I think that's one of the things to just be resolved to. Sometimes there's a couple of good explanations. um, But I'm sure, like you, you found some things that you've dealt with that I I go and, well, that's a – Here's two or three explanations, but there's nothing that I can say of just definitively is a, a, an amazing answer that makes me go, oh, okay, well, that's not a conflict at all. I mean, sometimes uh, you just have to find the best explanation in that sense. Yeah, I remember this question as vividly as possible and, and um, as an illustration of this. I was actually asked years and years ago what the Jew-Gentile ratio was in a certain community and I'm like, I got nothing. I'm like, uh, I, I really don't even know. You know, I'm like, uh, I'm not sure anybody knows. Um, yeah. But you know, and it bared on the text in some very particular, unique way. But here's a couple of things to kind of inch into that um, as um, boundary ideas and larger perspective ideas. One of them uh, would be this is a great place to to make folks aware of mentors. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, mentors do not have to be people who are older than you. They just have to be good at things that you're not good at. Uh, And so you're going to find folks in your life who are excellent at stuff that you can't begin to do. Uh, Build a strong relationship that allows critiquing in a healthy way and go to them and say, hey, look, you understand this better. Tell me what I need to know. What What do I need to read to learn in this? How do I get more insight into this area? about, again, in our cases, maybe some difficult sections. And we've blocked out a couple areas. We're gonna kind of review it real quickly. Some of these conflicts are covenantal in nature. That is that they're conflicts between two covenants where God asks distinctly different things of his people. Those are pretty simple to ratify once you teach about the nature of covenants in that sense. Some of these issues fall into very large baskets of understanding the culture of the, of the time period in which people live. Some of the phrases only make sense when you understand who's being spoken to um, or where they're living and how they're living. Uh, they don't apply equally in, uh, in the sense of that idiom doesn't carry for, forward, that metaphor doesn't carry forward. So learning the language that underlies um, conversation is really important. And some conflicts are genuinely uh, the conflict that exists in our hearts. Um, I'll say, at least from uh, this point in my teaching experience and this point in my preacher experience, a lot of the times when we struggle with the meaning of the scriptures, it has to do with the hardness of our own hearts. Um, A softer, more compliant, uh, submissive heart in view of God's expectations really changes the nature of some of these things that we call hard. 
Uh, and finally, when it comes to those genuine I don't knows, begin to ask different questions. Uh, I think that's the last thing I would add about that is that sometimes you're not finding an answer because you're just not asking the right question. Um, you just continue to repeat the same tired question that's going to get you the same tired answer, which isn't going to satisfy your spiritual. Now, I also realized something when we when I put out there difficult Bible passages, I'm sure some people were looking for a list of the top 10 scriptures that are challenging to understand. Um, that wasn't really what we were going for. Um, I'm sure it's a great study. Awesome. Wonderful. You know, um, uh, but I think the principles underlying it are more important than the particular answer you're going to get to a particular challenging text. If you if you want to find those difficult passages, uh, go to Jared Salt's blog, and what you'll learn there is that uh, he will either answer the passages that are difficult, or he'll make the ones you thought you understand more difficult. There's a bar, but Jared for today. Uh, but but uh, I will say this: you you mentioned the hardened of the heart. Uh, I do want to say this. I think sometimes we're afraid of having a blind faith, and I think that there's a difference between what the world might call a blind faith and what I would call more of a willing faith. Um, and I think I would encourage everybody to think of it that way. Uh, sometimes you may not have an answer, but that doesn't mean that you cannot still believe. Um, and I think we need to be willing to be, believe, and we need to be eager to have faith. Um, and like you said, with some of these things, you can be so hardened and, and, and Hal made a mention about people who aren't looking to believe just to argue. And I think you have to be careful not to fall into that category. Um, I know of a friend who's dealing with a situation I would put in that category now. And the issue there really has to do with some people who it appears just aren't willing to believe anymore. Um, with some, of, with, with some of the things we're talking about now, uh, and, and the reasoning for that has been, well, we've just been blinded and everything we believe has been wrong because of these few conflicts. Um, I would encourage people, if you approach those conflicts, don't be that way. Uh, try to maintain a willing, eager faith, wanting to believe rather than one that is hardened and, and refuses to. Especially in your approach to teaching. Um, to teach in an encouraging way. Um, and I realize it's challenging. Uh, teaching in an encouraging manner uh, requires a level of emotional commitment that on a Sunday to Sunday to Sunday basis uh, is a part of the work that gets kind of undervalued. Um, you know, people ask, uh, I don't know if you get this, Terry, this is a connection to the idea of this text and this concept. Now, why are you so tired at the end of Sunday? Like all you really did was stand there and talk. Um, yeah. And you may not have done that well. Um, and a, a, there's, a, there's an emotional component, component that wears you out from the inside out uh, in presenting the scriptures openly that's really hard to grasp until you've been in the soup for a little while. Um, and I think it really does even come up into these areas text where you don't know what to do um, yeah yeah and and it there's nothing more stressful than going into a, a class where you know you're going to be dealing with a tough subject um, you know if, if I'm teaching on something that say um, I, don't, I don't know the Sermon on the Mount which is pretty standard seems to be everybody's got a firm grasp on that um, that's, that's a lot easier than say going to Ezekiel and teaching from Ezekiel, um, that while I think I have a good grasp of it, you know, that there's a lot of questions about that, a revelation where there's a lot of different doctrines out there based off of that passage. So, um, that is, I think people don't understand, as you said, the emotional and mental exhaustion that could follow something like that. Um, and the hours of preparation just for that one forty-five minute. Yeah, we pour a lot into a small bucket and hope that it's and realize we probably failed about halfway through in planning out our menu of what was going to be in there, but we still got to serve the meal. Um, yeah, especially again on these areas of challenge where it's uh, how am I going to express this conflict of covenant, conflict of understanding, conflict of 
textual matters. Maybe the conflict is my own spirituality as it rises uh, or drops to meet the text. Um, in all of those categories, we can do a lot of good, especially if we begin to kind of focus in more deeply into what does God want us to come away with as his big point. And I'll, I'll use one more illustration of this. We talked about this a few weeks ago. I'll drop it here again. When you're looking at, and this is one uh, a familiar text for many, uh, the events in which Jesus turns water to wine. Uh, for a lot of folks, they would categorize that as a difficult Bible passage. Um, I prefer I used to because what Jesus turned the water into isn't in essence the conflict of the text. The conflicts of the text is the disciples who now believe because Jesus could do the thing. Um, uh, the thing is he turned water into not water. He made it into wine. Uh, I'm s essentially unconcerned with the alcoholic cont content at that point, even though for some I realize that's an issue and you could talk about it. But that changes the nature of the conflict of the text. It's not about what kind of wine he made. The head leader said it was great, but the disciples believed. Um, and that's a, that's a contextual shift in saying, what's the big point? And once you get to that big point, then a lot of these things will get a little bit easier. Absolutely. So, um, you know, uh, I'll add a couple things here as we close out our time together. Uh, thing number one, uh, if you've got questions about the work of an evangelist, you in some way, uh, we want to do that. Um, we certainly want to encourage great preaching, uh, great evangelism, and great work in the kingdom. And we're trying to do the best we can to be an aid in that regard. Um, and so you can drop us a line through any of the various ways to get a hold of us, and we'll do our very best to answer it, uh, starting with the answers of, I don't know. Uh, let me go dig a little farther. Um, beyond that, uh, with the school season uh, heavy in swing. Uh, I know Terry and I both at times will be called away for different things um, because of our various obligations, responsibilities, both congregationally but also family-wise. Um, I think not uh, this, actually I think it will be uh, two, sun, two Tuesdays from now. Uh, I won't be here, so uh, Terry will be working off of a different script on that day and that'll happen some as well. So uh, don't be surprised if you don't see either of us on the screen per se, and the schedule might bump around a little bit too. Uh, but um, we cannot control every single uh, facet of life around ourselves as much as we would like. Um, Terry, any parting shots from your end of the uh, of the of the world over there? No, just uh, enjoyed the discussion today and keep sharing these videos and uh, suggesting our page to other people and we can help you with some specific subject. Please let us know. Yep. Oh, yeah. And if you see Terry, he's going to need a hug because the volunteers have forgotten how to play football. Um, and so just you can dig on him because he enjoys that a little bit, too. But in the end, make sure you give him a hug because he's going to feel bad for a while. Uh, the shellacking they received was significant. I'm not even a, a, a giant Tennessee fan, but I live with a few of them. And the, the sorrow and lamenting is significant. Um, so well, just to, to cheer them up if you can. It's been about 15 years of sorrow, so our cup yeah. runneth over. Play man of constant sorrow, and he'll, he'll understand. Uh, he'll yeah, recognize absolutely. the tune and, and feel the anguish. All right, everybody, you guys have a great day, and uh, may the Lord bless you in everything you do. All right. Bye-bye.